Hello everybody and welcome to the Mental Health Science and Inequalities panel. My name is Jackie Dyer and I am NHS England's Mental Health Equalities Advisor, but also um, the Deputy Leader of Lambeth Council and a lived expert by experience. So the aim of today's session is to really highlight the importance for mental health science of tackling inequalities and being utterly intentional about doing so. So we're here to trauma are critical considerations in relation to inequality. And I, in my role locally as a lead for a, a local borough, um, face to face day in, day out around the interface of the social determinants of mental health and what that means for very many of our communities who experience multiple disadvantages and multi multiple discriminations. And there can be no greater time post COVID post George Floyd for us to really face the issues around inequalities and what that means for mental health. May I pass on? Thank you, Jackie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Hatch from King's College London. And today, each panelist will give us a brief introduction from their perspective of what mental health science is before we open up for a broader discussion. Speakers will address two key questions. How bad is the problem of inequalities in mental health and how their discipline addresses inequalities in mental health? They will be focusing on the unique lens that their discipline brings and on solutions that it offers. First up, we have Anne John from Swansea University. Over to you, Anne. Thanks. That I've always had a focus on inequalities and I think that it's important to acknowledge that at least the discussion is happening now whereas before it never used to you would always come up against a brick wall and I think in terms of inequalities in mental health you know I'm, we've talked a lot about wider determinants but it's important to recognize that the inequalities we look at really reflect what's happening in our society. You know, we have not seen an improvement in life expectancy in our population for a, for a decade. And that reflects um, all the systems that are interacting, that intersectionality that uh, Jackie was talking about. And I think it's important to recognize there are inequalities in mental health, so there are people in our society who are much more likely to have adverse mental health outcomes. But also, there are huge inequalities both in the physical health experience of those with mental health problems, but also in the mental health experience of those with physical health problems that are experiencing um, inequality. So it's, it, you know, it's deeply complex. It, it incorporates poverty, discrimination, childhood maltreatment. I think COVID has really thrown it um, forward. That doesn't mean people are going to act. So I was involved in a project led by Matthias Pierce from uh, Manchester University that, and basically at the beginning of the pandemic, um, analysing understanding society um, data we showed that those whose mental health had deteriorated disproportionately were from deprived communities, um, young people, and pe people with uh, young children. Analyzing data up to October, the high risk groups who'd had consistently poor or deteriorating mental health were those from ethnic minority populations, people from deprived communities and those with pre-existing mental and physical health problems. You know, and I, I remember when we saw the results and when we were writing the press release, uh, I just wanted to go, how many times do we have to keep highlighting this? You know, so, so, so governments, policy makers, commissioners, they do respond to the data we can put forward 
And we need to keep showing that that problem exists because I'm often told you're being very political and I'm going, I'm not. I'm basing it completely on stacks of evidence over decades. We need to do that, but I also think we need to really consider about how much we take our science and understand that that turns us into advocates. That's all I was going to say. Oh, and I was going to hand over to um, to JRT Desmanushi from King's College. I may have got that name. I may have pronounced her surname wrong. That's fine, Anne. Thank you. So, um, so I'm Jade Desmanushi. I'm a psychiatrist and also an epidemiologist um, from King's College London. I guess for me, it's this is all very. I mean, who'd have thought just over a year ago we'd all be sitting here in our houses, our homes peering into a laptop and talking about mental health inequalities. COVID over the last year has really impacted all of our lives. And I think what it's also done, as uh, Anne has highlighted, has really pulled into sharp focus and opened up and laid bare those inequalities that we already knew um, existed. We've known for decades that ethnic minority groups experience inequalities within the service. So, so the Mental Health Act Review in 2018 highlighted three decades of research showing that Black Caribbean and uh, Black African people are much more likely to experience coercive pathways into care. There are decades of research showing that ethnic minority communities are less likely to be offered evidence-based treatments for mental health, talking therapies, psychological, like for example, uh, cognitive behavioural therapies. And we also know that um, the, the prevalence of severe mental illnesses is elevated in, in certain ethnic minority groups, particularly those who have a history of migration. We know that racism is associated with um, a, an, increased, um, an increased prevalence of mental health problems. So we've known this for some time. And I guess the key question is, at this point, how can mental health sciences help to address this? And that's the sort of, that's the sort of the big kind of challenge. And I guess what COVID has also shown us is that people like data. So it's, it's absolutely amazing how people are very engaged with just looking at maps of COVID prevalence in their local area or even trend lines. And the reason why it's engaging is because it's not just uh, presented in a visually appealing way, but also because it tells people something about themselves. So from my perspective as a clinician, as, and as well as somebody who works with data, I really think that over the next few years, we should be thinking about how can we use data in real time to help us not just try and understand um, these inequalities that I've already spoken about and track them in real time, but also think about how can we empower people to um, potentially push for change in services and even use data to hold services to account, as well as using it to try and, at the front line, use to uh, improve care. But I think that's a big, it's a big challenge and a big challenge that I think we should be rising to and thinking about um, as we move forward. Thank you. So I'm just going to hand hand over to uh, Dr. Raj Mohan from South London Morsley Trust. Thank you, Jay. Um, and can I just say thank you for inviting me to, to this panel. Um, inequalities are a very important concern for us, and there has been no time like the present to actually look at the impact of it on health. Um, I would say that inequalities manifest in all forms of health conditions, physical health conditions and mental health conditions. And my way of looking at it is that it is like the final common endpoint of all the negative experiences that people have gone through in their lives. Uh, that includes trauma, discrimination, disadvantage, all forms of um, discrimination, in fact. So um, as a clinician, one of the things that I have to constantly focus on, it is to absolutely ensure that everyone who comes into mental health services gets uh, the right kind of care based on their needs. And this care has to be equitable. So this has to be also focused on delivering the right kind of access for the people who need it, uh, ensuring that the experience of care is equitable and that there's good outcomes for all groups of individuals. But at the same time, although I work in mental health and I don't actually have a chance to look at the factors that got people to that point, we just cannot afford to lose sight of all the structural factors that underlie poor mental health. Um, there are a number of these factors, and also they underlie physical health conditions as well. 
So structural disadvantage contributes to poor mental health or poor physical health through determining the social, social factors or social determinants of mental health. Um, these are not automatically addressed by mental health services because we are treating the symptoms, they're treating the outcomes of what happened, and we do need to be focusing much more on understanding these things. And you understand them by working with people and learning what their experience has been, and you try and mitigate them where you can. But I looked look at researchers and, and, and warned them to look at housing, uh, inequalities in income, inequalities in employment, and differential experiences of discrimination, trauma, uh, including racial trauma. And I want to see more research in these areas. And then I want us to be thinking about prevention, uh, first and foremost. So I would see that mental health services have to move towards a info trauma-informed approach where people are able to pick out um, racial trauma, especially, but all forms of discrimination. And clinicians need to have the skills to work with all different groups of people. I'm not going to go on any longer, but uh, this is my uh, turn to introduce Frank Keating, and he's from the Royal Holloway University. Over to you, Frank. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. Um, my name is Frank Keating. I'm from Royal Holloway, University of London, and my research is mainly around racialized inequalities in mental health. I'm not going to talk about that because people have already mentioned it, but I'm, I'm talking from a social work perspective um, and inequalities. Now, if we look at um, social work, the aim of social work practice and research is to address social justice or to improve social justice. Uh, and this is enshrined in the international definition of uh, the International Federation of Social Work. Um, and social work, as we know, work with the most marginalized groups in society, work with multiple disadvantage. And so one would expect that uh, addressing inequalities would be at the heart of social work research. Unfortunately, this doesn't follow through. Um, I did a quick stroll through the um, British Journal of Social Work, which is one of the key journals in social work in this country. Um, and inequalities is sometimes only addressed as a special issue or as an add-on or as a single issue. Um, and and um, so this doesn't follow through. So what how can we then um, make mental health science in relation to social work um, more engaged with, social, with inequalities? And I think a starting point for me is that we need to adopt a critical approach. And a critical approach is, you know, can be informed by critical theory, can be informed by intersectionalities, um, social constructivism, critical race theory, critical feminist theory, queer theories, disability theories. Um, I think those are starting points to, be, to help us to engage with inequalities. But we also need creative methodologies. Um, so I would say things like part participatory action research, co-production, user-led research are just some simple ways in which we can um, move forward in, in, in beginning Meaning to understand inequalities and also it, because my view would be that if we have a sound understanding of the issue, then we can develop sound um, uh, solutions for the issues. Thank you very much. And I hand you over to Garrett Griffith from the University of Bristol. Uh, hi there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Gareth Griffith. I'm a researcher at the University of Bristol in the MRC uh, Integrative Epidemiology Unit. Uh, I sit in a slightly weird spot in these conversations, I often think, because I'm a researcher, so I guess I would now call myself a psychiatric epidemiologist, which is a fancy name for someone who cares about populations and sad people and stuff, I guess. But by background, I'm a quantitative geographer, um, but my interest in, in my research topic comes from a personal experience of depression, um, having tried come quite close a couple of times in my life to, to not being here, I guess. Um, but what, one of the things that I think that um, my, my background in, in, a, in a geographical discipline really brings to the table in, in discussing uh, inequality specifically is an appreciation of context. And I think that context specifically is something that's come across so many times in the conversations that have been part of the MQ discussions so far. And I think uh, obviously ge geographical science thinks of, thinks of context as space and place primarily, but it can be location, it can be your social context. But I think context is important for, for two main reasons. So context is, as we've heard, incredibly crucial for mental health, but it's important for, for participation in studies, 
because it affects who gets counted. It affects people's engagement in studies, but it's also important because it affects your concepts. It affects who counts themselves, who considers themselves part of these groups who are, who are identifying as mentally ill or not. And my, my main research area at the moment is that when we condition on participation in studies, when we only include people who turn up to studies voluntarily, that has real world implications and it can bias the results of that research for not just the people who we are excluding, but also for the people who we are, we are focusing on. And that's something that I think we're only just really starting to appreciate as a consequence. So, I mean, to, to not to sound like I'm making it all about me, but I certainly wouldn't have turned up at those periods in my life when I was, when I was really, really not, not doing well. Uh, and, I, and I also at the time didn't count myself amongst those people who uh, should identify as, as having severe mental illness. So I think uh, my, my job now is doing all the fancy stats in the world, trying to, trying to get back from these uh, voluntary participation studies towards, towards estimates which we can generalize to the general population. And there are, there are very smart people who do lots of very fancy stats on that. But I think fundamentally increasing engagement and, and participation in such studies is the, is the only thing that we can do that is, it, it's more effective and it's more equitable to have, to have engagement with those, those groups from the outset of such studies. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop now. But so I'm delighted to introduce you to Neha Shah, who is uh, working with Public Health England and City University. Thanks. Um, so yes, uh, as introduced, I come from a public health um, and a policy perspective, but I also work clinically as a psychodynamic therapist. So I've kind of got my hat both in the population and my individual space. Um, I think the speakers before me have really beautifully illustrated how your chance of achieving good mental health varies according to who you are, what you do and where you live. And I think the important thing for me to sort of highlight really is that much of the psychological stress experienced by these groups who are seen as more vulnerable um, will be related to the social and the structural aspects of the context in which people live. And thus, this has to be an integral part of action to address inequalities. So we do know now that there's a broad evidence base to it, support the importance of addressing social determinants. And this varies across demographic, economic, neighbourhood, um, environmental and social and cultural domains. Um, and this links forward to a much broader policy agenda around the social um, goals. So it's sort of it is mental health. But as people have said, it's also about our development generally, and it's also about our physical health. So just moving on to the next slide as well. Um, so this is a sort of evidence based framework that was developed by PHE and the UCL Institute of Health Equity. And although it's probably not coming across very clearly in this very packed slide, what this does show is how our position in society um, and the wider macroeconomic context in which we live affects um, and is interrelated with our differential exposures and vulnerabilities to those more commonly known social determinants. So things like income, employment, housing, and how this also affects the structures in, and the solidarity with the communities and relationships you build. Um, and that how that then impacts upon how we think, feel and behave in relation to our mental and physical health. And so all of this is integrated. It's a complex and nonlinear relationship. And so it doesn't make it easy to research, but it doesn't mean that because of that, we should be ignoring um, the wider situation and how all of these elements work together. I think it's really important that we use this knowledge to effectively develop policies and interventions that address these wider structural inequalities. And we do know that the evidence base is weak when it comes to this um, in terms of prevention funding and also really in terms of knowing what to do in relation to interventions that address, thing, um, address social determinants at this scale. Um, and a recent Lancet Commission did also highlight how globally um, effective prevention and effective intervention at that non-clinical level is lagging behind. So in terms of the research aspect of what we need to do to help address these inequalities, I think we need to think about data sets, um, as people have mentioned, including everybody in those data sets, but also recognising the limitation of population data sets and where we need to do more focused research, um, requires methodologies and interdisciplinary working, requires data sets that integrate social determinants and mental health outcomes, partnerships with communities and non-health settings. And also, lastly, being introduced, uh, being interested rather in what works to improve mental health for everybody, not only those with established mental health problems, although recognising the increased need that this group has. Thank you. So I will um, now introduce Giovanna Pilato from the Care Quality Commission. Thank you very much. 
I'm Giovanna Maria Polato. I'm uh, a, an analyst team leader with the Care Quality Commission. I've been working here for um, about 15 years and uh, mostly on uh, what we call large data sets. Uh, these are the data sets that are secondary use uh, uh, data. So they are collected directly by um, providers when uh, care is uh, uh, provided to the patients or to the service users. And uh, we use these uh, as a means to understand what uh, is happening within uh, uh, providers, but above all, to understand um, how people have uh, received access to care, what the pathways into cares are, uh, to a certain extent, what their experiences are as far as we can uh, within uh, the scope of these data sets and what their outcomes are. So they are a mean to understand and uh, how patients, carers and family experience services and how services provide for uh, the people who use them. We have been working on this uh, for uh, quite uh, a long while. Um, I mean, we started looking at uh, these uh, in uh, 2005, between 2005 and 2010, with Count Me, and when uh, ethnicity was still not a well-established uh, data item within uh, uh, the collections. And at that time, we introduced uh, some other items that have become into their own more recently, such as uh, um, um, assaults, uh, restraints, uh, recording, and recording of other adverse events that can happen uh, during uh, um, care in, uh, in mental health services. We also have developed uh, means to link these data sets together so that we can perhaps uh, uh, pick up uh, patients uh, who are being cared for in the mental health units and uh, when things work well in terms of uh, linkages, we can follow them if they happen to be attending, say, A&E, either during their admissions or uh, um, once they are in the community, and uh, whether they are then admitted uh, to acute, so we can follow up uh, um, issues that uh, might uh, take place during um, the, the episode of care in that way. We have been working extensively on uh, uh, making changes to the data items that we collect ourselves, most notably during uh, COVID. We were asked uh, to uh, assist the Office for National Statistics with uh, notifications of uh, death, because we have uh, a well-developed notification systems that's used by provider. So we modified our death notification systems to uh, work in a more um, in a speedier fashion, so we can assist uh, the, um, the recording of uh, mortality during due to COVID. But also, uh, almost immediately, we're asked to supply more data about uh, protective characteristics of the patients who uh, were notified to us as having died. So we introduced. Uh, a, a better uh, system of recording uh, some of the necessary items, uh, including obviously ethnicity and uh, sexual orientation. We had some uh, um, issues about the fact that it is quite difficult to record some of these items uh, once the person uh, has died, but uh, uh, we did the best we could at the time and it worked quite well to the point that we are now introducing uh, changes to notification to other notifications of uh, other events that will allow to uh, follow um, to analyze the data by protected characteristics. We are somewhat hampered in terms of uh, um, the use of secondary data, secondary use data, because obviously we have to maintain patient confidentiality, which uh, where you have providers that are quite small or uh, when you start analysing the data at quite uh, capillary level can be quite an issue. But uh, um, in terms of not being able to report uh, on events that are at below seven, because we have to suppress uh, uh, the data for confidentiality reason. We've also been collaborating in uh, changes to the use of force act at the time when uh, it was being considered uh, and uh, um, for implementation and uh, ever since by making sure that uh, changes to the mental health services data set 
to be able to monitor the implementation of the use of force act were made in time and these went in into version four of the mental health services data set were collected from uh, April 2019 and more changes will go in in October this year to align protected characteristics to the ones uh, collected in the census of population 2021 and uh, and also to uh, introduce some additional elements, uh, such as uh, uh, whether the police were called to the unit uh, um, at, uh, um, at the time associated. We are working on closed cultures, in particular regard to learning disability, but uh, um, we are developing sets of indicators uh, and a product that can be applied to uh, both health and social care. Um, and obviously with uh, the uh, impediment caused by the data being variable across different sectors, but uh, uh, we are hoping to be able to be quite, um, to, be, to, to be having quite a useful product. And we're also looking at provider collaboration reviews. So looking at the experience of patients for particular services across a, across a local area um, and uh, for the time being, the ones I've been involved in myself have been uh, on mental health uh, for children and young people and uh, learning disability for children and young people. Um, so this is the work we have in train right now. And I'm always happy to um, speak and work with colleagues and uh, provide more information when needed. Great, thank you all, thank you. Um, I think right now we'll just, I'll turn over to Jackie for any initial reflections on um, the speaker's comments. So I think that there's a resounding understanding that we've got to do so much better than what we've done thus far. And actually it's almost like everybody knows and yet we've not really put in the work to actually transform the situation. It's like, oh, the task is far too hard. So you know what, let's just sweep that one under the carpet a bit and get on with the easier stuff. And yet actually where what we are faced with now is the avoidance of that. And now we've got a mountain to climb. But what we've got in that context is people, a range of people that know that keenly really putting to the forefront um, cross-cutting research that informs uh, mental health, that is is led by mental health in a sense, um, is really going to help us to address the inequities and the harm that's been experienced by so many members of our population in the absence of us giving the level of attention that is really required of it. And, and I think that that's really an important point to sort of like emphasize when it pertains to the world of mental health uh, provision, because here you are working with people, I myself, um, when they are, when we, I, us, are at our most vulnerable. And so that requires the most excellence of any research, of any professional, of any service to be at the top of their game. So the requirement here is for us to really get into this arena to support decision makers, to support commissioners, to support policy thinking, to support boroughs, to support ICSs, to support individual uh, providers on this agenda so that we can support more, much more effectively the individuals that really need us to be at the top of our game. I would like to just um, sort of indicate one of the mechanisms in a sense that is here to help from the racialized perspective, but also from um, NHS England's perspective. So we have an advancing mental health equality strategy. Um, Stephanie's involved with, with that with myself. And this is about in helping local health systems to improve, really cleaning up the data so that the data can be robustly used to help the system improve itself, and also really equipping the workforce 
to be not just more inclusive, but also um, competent in being able to deliver high quality services to, to, to our population. And the other thing is the patient and care and race equality framework, of which there are three key, ele key elements. One is about the, it's an accountability framework, which is from, from the people, somebody mentioned here, I think it was Jay, talking about being much more accountable and much more engaged with our communities in order to um, uh, uh, have any sense of integrity. So the three uh, areas of the patient and care race equality framework are one, um, the statutory and regulatory obligations. Part of that work is happening with the CQC, for example, as one area of use of force uh, uh, as well. There are others. The other is about organisational competencies. And there's a range of those, one of which is around cultural awareness, around data and all this kind of thing. And the other is about a creation of a feedback mechanism in order to give more real-time sort of uh, feedback about whether or not services are really working well. Well, all in all, all of that needs to be supported by high quality and credible research so that we're actually really dealing contextually in every context with what it is that matters. I know as, as the deputy leader of my council, I am dealing with day in, day out, the absence of a commitment to dealing with this agenda because trauma happens right across the whole spectrum. It's not just about what happens when people are coercively pulled off the street. That is, there's a whole pathway into that. And that is what we really need to look at in a sort of much more integrated way than what we've done thus far. So, Stephanie. Oh, Jackie, you're a difficult person to follow on, on reflection because you put that so succinctly and so um, eloquently I, and so passionately. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of the points that were made. I mean, I think when Anne said, you know, mental health science turns us into advocates and i would add, i would add activists yes. as well um and I, I think that's something that we can get behind as you know the way forward for researchers not only to you know people who are currently doing research but how we train um those coming through the pipeline and reimagine what research can be how it needs to be, particularly in this area, translational from the start. And, and as Frank said, you know, using creative methodologies, making sure that we've got those, those aspects of co-production, participatory approaches right from the very beginning. It's too late when you go to a community or when someone comes to me and asks me, you know, well, how do I get, you know, greater participation as Gareth was talking about, like who's at the table, who's included? It's too late if you've not already been engaging with these communities in, in many ways. So I would encourage people to be training researchers in mental health science to be thinking about those steps that come even before you start asking the questions. What is the ethos of your research groups? Thinking about the reciprocity with communities, um, you know, with those with lived experience, thinking of, and also about the sustainability. And I would ask the funders to think about that as well. To, to really put some effort and some, some funds towards funding that process that, that comes before, because when nobody can do anything for free. You know, as Raj was talking about, this is, we're dealing with some serious structural issues, structural inequalities that, you know, sort of overarching, you know, influencing the experiences that people are having. And to that end, I think what Raj said about services really needing to make take more consideration about what those structural determinants are and to think about how we can work across sectors to actually tackle those structural inequalities as a part of this. Um, and, and then finally, I just, you know, I think, Gareth, your point about context is so important, both social context as well as, well as place and space. And so really thinking about where, you know, who's represented, not only who's represented, but where are they, you know, where are they living? Where, wh which areas are we not looking into? Where is the, the inequalities in rural mental health in all of this, in our seaside communities and places that 
have been economically struggling, that have lost their industry. You know, where where are those people in our work? Are we making sure that that you know, as well as the urban areas that are so important? Um, so I, I will leave it there. I want to encourage, please, the audience to submit your questions. Um, we have had a question come through um, that I'll read out, and it's to Jay, um, who mentioned migrants having worse mental health outcomes. But the challenge is that nationality is not one of the nine protected characteristics. So when talking about diversity, either for co-production or in research participants, we need to make an effort to include migrants. Um, and even, you know, making the point that even the funders won't, you know, don't many times ask you about this uh, characteristic of people's lives. Could you say a little bit more about that, Jay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's a really good question. Um, it isn't one of the protected characteristics. I suppose, um, you know, I think as Jackie highlights, we're still at the point where we, we actually need to collect those protected characteristics. We're still not doing that, actually, as just even a basic measure in electronic health records or, or you know, any sort of routine data source. So, so I think just to make the point that we need to do that, we still haven't done that properly. But I think you're absolutely right. I think migration is one of the aspects that I think could potentially that that lived experience of movement, the reasons why people move, all those things can come into play when we're thinking about mental health. But I also highlighted racism. There's a fairly robust literature around impact discrimination, increasing the risk of mental health problems, any, any physical health problems, any health problems actually, not just mental health. So there are, I think, many factors that come into the lived experience of um, ethnic minority people in the UK um, that I think can play a role. So um, it's not, uh, so I think it's not so much, um, you know, we have the protected characteristics that we do need to be collecting data on, but I think in those very well designed studies, um, we need to be thinking about what it, tagged I guess to the research question, what is it that we're actually trying to assess and then developing methods to work with those groups in you know, co-production efforts or, you know, uh, and elsewhere. Thank you, Jay. I think what the next question, I'd, op I'd like to open up to uh, the panel uh, more widely. And the question is, what would the panel suggest is done to encourage the greater inclusion of individuals who are most at risk of being detained or detained into research that will impact themselves and others in their community? Um, Anne. So I guess, you know, grassroots, it's what you say. It's working with people in communities, co-producing, having them in from the design of the study, get it, letting people have some ownership because they've been there from the beginning. And, and I think that grassroots, that's how. More strategically, I think that research councils need to make it make these things stipulations in um, when they're doing their sort of grant descriptions. You know, make sure that the population that you the the, po the population you're recruiting for your study has to be um, representative, has to include people from you know ethnic minorities, but also from other protected characteristics and inequalities. And that researchers then, because it's linked to funding, that it's in the call spec, have to do it. And I think that's, you know, when you think about behavior change in general, and I've been doing a lot of that stuff during COVID, you know, if you think about something like um, seatbelts, it, it requires both changing the way people think about something, enabling them to make those choices, but sometimes hugging that in legislation. So, so I, think, I think a big change is research councils changing call specs and changing and ensuring, and I know that they do a lot of this, increasing representation on, on panels with, with researchers from very diverse backgrounds, not just ethnic minorities, but socioeconomic backgrounds so that you're getting that diversity of perspective. All right, thank you. Frank, would you like to come in? Yeah, I would, I would echo that. And I think we should use the motto from the um, disability rights movement, which says nothing without us. 
nothing about us without us um, is the important thing. But I also would suggest, I mean, I was in, I was just doing a piece of work around black men and mental health recovery. And I recruited participants through community organizations that I work with. Um, and I had to go and beg from the funders to give me money to support those community organizations. So what I think we need to do is also funders need to provide a, um, sufficient support so that we can engage in communities in our research. They talk about um, patient PPI involved, patient and patient participant or PPI involvement. Um, and, and I think so for my, so there's two things. A, it's nothing with uh, nothing about us with us, without us. And then secondly, um, we need to think about how we can secure funding to engage our community organizations because they are at the heart of the what happens in people's lives. They are at the heart of what, what happens in communities. And so therefore we need to fund them. And, and, and when I gave these organizations the funding, um, I had no difficulty in recruiting people because they 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 were in contact with individuals. And so I think for me, that's a good starting point. So we've got about five minutes left. I want to make sure I get this really important question in and allow people a chance to address it, because this is really to move things forward. We need to think about tackling these inequalities. So if the panel had an audience with Parliament, what would the panel suggest Parliament do to tackle these inequalities in mental health. And Raj, would you like to start? Thank you, Stephanie. I was hoping you would ask me that question. Um, there's something really important I want to ask them is to stop denying that there is a problem such as structural inequality. They have just published this atrocious report, which literally goes into the research, into this area, shows that there is significant level of structural inequality and structural racism in all different areas. In, in a criminal justice uh, system, in policing, in health, all of that. And then they go on to, I don't know what part is missing, but they just go on to conclude that no such thing exists. And the difficulty with this is that when the government at that level is complicit with denying the existence of structural factors, there is really no incentive for them to address this. So we're up against much, much bigger mountains, so much bigger barriers at the moment. And this is one thing. I will happily pick an argument with them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Gareth, would you like to come in? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd like to echo that. And I think one of the things that um, I think I think that I would really press uh, a, a government person on is that is that you need to stop looking for for short quick fixes for these things stop looking for a you know like a stupid little app which is going to solve mental health stop being like we can individually lean in and nail racism on like an individual basis we can like personally do enough well-being seminars or go to a puppy room in our university campuses or something that is such a banal like facile way of thinking about this clearly endemic problem and that, that if you if you if you think only in terms of these big quick fixes that are very very large scale top down solutions, those things are 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 probably less effective, and they're also incredibly easy to to reverse. Like you you see big policy changes which just flip between subsequent parliaments because they have only ever been interested in a top down solution rather than as Frank has said and as as Anna has said, but with engaging with the people who are on the ground in. In these in these community groups, who 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 know the best thing that you can do for for their communities, and those things are way harder for sure. It is way harder to, to foster community change and grassroots organisations, but the change is much more lasting. And it isn't just going to flip the next time you get booted out of office and someone else is like, I got elected on another you know, another promise of something that probably won't happen. Sorry, that was a rant. <laughs> it was a good one, Giovanna. <laughs> I think if there was uh, one thing that uh, I, I were able to ask is for uh, uh, attention to uh, child and adolescent uh, mental health, because uh, I think there are many cases where uh, services can help early on and also for easier uh, and uh, more uh, streamlined access to uh, mental health services uh, for all other um, age groups. Uh, 
I think that uh, there are still uh, inequalities, uh, uh, geographical inequalities, if nothing else, about uh, how easy it is uh, to um, access services uh, when uh, at, at the beginning of uh, one's journey into mental health services. And if that were to be easier, it is uh, uh, possible that many potential issues might be um, ameliorated earlier on. Thank you, Giovanna. Neha? Yeah, so I think for me, one of the core themes would be about broadening the perspective from clinical settings um, and health settings to think about the world in which we live. So where we work, live and play and making sure that that's integral to the policy agenda. And I think, you know, almost contrary to what Gareth is saying, I think there's a real opportunity for both using the data and for evidence based policy to make sure we make the most of the structural levers we have at that national, at that government setting. You know, there's research that supports welfare, it being, benefits being non conditional. Um, more inclusive migration policy as beneficial to mental health. And if we can use that type of evidence to really drive change, you know, I think we are winning there, as well as doing all of that community and grassroots work, which is so important, which has really been talked about today. Great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time, and there's some really great other suggestions that are coming in. Frank said, I'd, I would like to ask them to do a placement in one of the most disadvantaged areas of their catchment area. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So uh, thank you all. Thank you to the speakers. Um, thank you, Jackie, for co-chairing this with me. And now we'll turn mm -hmm. over, turn back over to Lee. all of our panellists uh, for an incredible discussion uh, in our headline slot of the event. Uh, in these final uh, 10 minutes of the conference, uh, before I give my closing remarks, uh, I want to hand over uh, to find out who were the winners uh, of our poster prize submissions. Uh, this year's sponsor of the poster prize room was Cohen Veterans Biosciences, uh, sponsoring the networking poster room. Um, Cohen Veteran Biosciences is a fantastic nonprofit. Uh, biomedical research and technology organization based in the US. Uh, to hand out the awards for this year, uh, I'm delighted to pass over to Peter Jones, chair of the organizing committee of this event and MQ trustee. Peter, who are our winners? Well, thank you, Lee. I'm here to um, tell people who's who've won the poster prizes. I'd firstly just like to thank you for your leadership of the Mental Health Sciences Summit during the past couple of days. It's been absolutely tremendous, so much to think about and digest. But my task is um, the posters, and I'm here on behalf of the organising committee. The standard of posters was absolutely tremendous. We peer reviewed all the abstracts. Uh, they were excellent. Not all of them got through the triage. The posters were even better and it's a real pleasure to uh, spend time with them. We've got two prizes. One is the organizers MQ Welcome Trust Prize and the other is the delegate prize. Uh, it was very close. The winners are each going to receive a 200 pound prize and we'll get that over to you um, as soon as we can. So the MQ Welcome Prize, the winner is Celine Fox from Trinity College Dublin with colleagues uh, in that institution and elsewhere. Metacognitive biases in anxious depression improve with therapeutic gains. Evidence from a four week observational study of internet based CBT and antidepressant treatment. And this was work done on data collected from Claire Gillen's MQ Fellowship. And it was a really a uh, tremendous mix of um, mechanism, experiment, novel data collection pointed towards therapeutic benefit and a beautiful prize as well. So congratulations, Celine. The delegate prize goes to Neve McSweeney from Edinburgh University, understanding the neurobiology of irritability in adolescent depression 
development of a novel fMRI task using a co-produced youth researcher design. And I particularly love the way you've got that co-production in a test you can use in a, in a scanner to uh, provoke irritability. Well done. And that was funded by the Wellcome Trust and Mental Health Research UK. So congratulations to both prize winners and well done to everyone else. It was a really great poster session. Back to you, Lee. Thank you, Peter, and congratulations to both winners, and thank you to everyone uh, who submitted a poster uh, this year. Uh, it lies with me uh, to try and bring uh, all of our thoughts in the last two days to a close. Um, the best I can summarise and offer is four very lay uh, understanding points of what I think it is uh, I've heard uh, over the last two days of content. The first thing I think I've heard uh, is that we've got to work harder to recognise the trauma of inequalities uh, and put those people in communities that are currently often invisible in research at the very centre and importantly at the start of planning uh, how we answer some of those tough questions. The second thing for me is I think we've seen again and again the advantages of taking a whole mind, body and brain approach to mental health research, combining all disciplines and perhaps COVID has given us the moment and the opportunity to organise in a more collaborative way than we ever have before. There's also been lots of conversation about the need for better data and focus on data structures. And we heard the announcement uh, about the Data Mind project uh, that's being funded by HDR UK and MRC. Um, if you're out there and you want your data to be part of that project uh, and to uh, help to advance uh, that infrastructure, uh, then do get in touch with Anne John, who's the PI of that project. And the fourth and final thing uh, I think from my perspective is uh, it's been incredible hearing the voices of so many uh, with lived experience and the challenges they've set. Um, and Niall Boyce said uh, yesterday that uh, he compared the need for a framework uh, and action on public involvement uh, and true co-production and research uh, to be the same as the response to the ethical challenges of research uh, that were sorted out in the past. And I think that's a challenge that he's laid down and has been laid down by everyone with lived experience who uh, has shared at this summit that we cannot ignore. It's with me to say a few thank yous uh, to everyone who has made this possible. Firstly, a huge thank you uh, to Welcome, uh, who have supported the entire event uh, and played a key role in the organising committee. Without their support, this event would not be possible. Also to Cohen Veterans Bioscience for sponsoring our poster and networking rooms. I want to say thank you to Peter Jones uh, for chairing the org organising committee so ably. I think the range of speakers uh, that we've heard and the panel discussions um, have incorporated a, a huge, vast uh, wealth of knowledge. Uh, the organising committee themselves from uh, Welcome, Kat Sebastian, Kate Martin, uh, and Laura McGrath from MQ, Peter Jones, Sarah Shenow, uh, and Mariana Bolivar, and from Mental Health, Andre Tomlin. And thank you to the whole Mental Health team uh, for all of your live coverage of the event via Twitter. I also want to thank all of the chairs, the speakers, uh, and the panelists. Thank you for your time prior to this event, for uh, sharing your knowledge, for pre-recording certain elements of this, and working through all the challenges of doing an event virtually. I want to say a huge thank you to uh, the small army of people uh, that are here at the RCP uh, from the MQ team uh, who've helped to make it possible and a massive thank you uh, to the Royal College of Physicians team uh, who have seamlessly pulled all this together in a virtual event. Uh, you can't see them all but they're right up there staring down at me. They're waving. Thank you so much for all you've done uh, and working through all of the challenges uh, of this event. And I also want to say thank you to all the delegates uh, who have come uh, and attended the event. Without you, it wouldn't be possible. And uh, hopefully, you've taken away learnings from this. If you uh, want to see any of the content again, uh, it will all shortly be uploaded uh, on the RCP platform and be available for the next 30 days. Uh, and we'll send you an email to confirm how you can access all of that content.
finally, two dates uh, to put in your diary. Um, firstly, the MQ Mental Health Data Science Meeting uh, that will be taking place uh, on the 22nd of September. Uh, the theme of this particular meeting will be Mental Health Data Science, Inequality, Diversity, diversity and Representativeness. Uh, so you can find out more about that on the MQ website where you'll be able to book uh, your free ticket there. And uh, if you've enjoyed what you've heard at this summit this year, uh, then put the date in your diary for next year's summit. Uh, it will be the 18th and 19th of May, 2022. Um, I've given up on predicting what's going to happen in the world of COVID. Uh, so I have absolutely no idea how much it will be physical, virtual, uh, or what that will look like. But I have absolutely no doubt uh, that as we bring the mental health sciences community together, it'll be a fantastic opportunity to tackle the big questions. And just like this year, come up with hopefully some tangible actions as to how we advance mental health understanding to create a brighter future for everyone. Thank you all. Uh, have a great rest of your evening. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed the Mental Health Science Summit 2021 in partnership with Welcome.